our next speaker is Professor John Gabrielli from MIT. Um, he's going to tell us about neural correlates of familial and socioeconomic stress. Good morning. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be involved in such an inspired and inspiring conference. The speakers you've heard this morning already, the speakers who are uh, coming up this afternoon, are working on such important topics. And the, audio, the audience is full of people who are thinking and caring about these. So it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to participate in this really important uh, conversation. And I'm going to talk to you today about some neural correlates of familial and socioeconomic stress. And so uh, the way I think about it, and perhaps many of us do, is that infants are born into this world either lucky or unlucky in their genetic predispositions to deal with adversity, into the environments in which they're born, uh, relative affluence or relative poverty, uh, and into the way their brains fit into the world that we have constructed. I won't talk about dyslexia today, uh, but a thousand years ago, if you had a brain that wasn't well geared for reading, it made no difference. Today, it blocks you from learning in school, right? So it's not absolutes. It's partly the fit between the minds and brains of children as they're born and the world we give to them, uh, the variety in the world and the, and the way we organize the world. And I'm going to focus on two things. Uh, and I'm going to hand wave on stress, because uh, I, ha I have no direct evidence about stress, but I know that we're talking about two domains in which stress is evidently related to the phenomena we're talking about, and give you a little one slide of data from other people to support that. So one of them is stress in individuals who, are, who have the diagnosis of depression. And these are measures of cortisol responsivity. And what this is showing you is greater responsivity, either as a function on the left of the number of uh, stressors these individuals face in daily life, or on the right, uh, the severity of their depression, the greater cor cortisol sensitivity in response to a stressor. And in the bottom figures are, are uh, the number of stresses faced by children in, in um, poorer versus more affluent environments, of course, greater stressors in the poorer environments. And, and again, the cortical sensitivity associated with the stress response associated with socioeconomic status of the family into which you were born. So let me talk about depression for a moment. One of the things we want to understand about depression and the brain differences associated with depression are when we see a difference in a depression uh, in an individual's brain or a group of individuals, to what extent is that the cause of the depression or the consequence of the depression? When a person is in the full throes of depression, both things are in their brains, how they got there and how they're dealing with the situation they're in now and responding to it. So one way that researchers have attempted to tease this apart a bit is to look at individuals who are born to parents with a history of depression. And it's, just, it's a research strategy. Many children who are born to parents with depression will not de develop depression. But there's about a three or four-fold increase of the likelihood that a child born to a parent with depression will develop depression. So it gives us a chance to think about what might be the root causes as we ch move, children move from childhood through adolescence into vulnerability to depression. And uh, people who study depression have uh, talked about a cognitive bias as an element of depression. And so in the, you know, we talk all the time about the glass being half full or half empty. Uh, much of life is like that. I mean, sometimes it's amazingly wonderful. Sometimes it's brutally awful, no matter how you look at it, right? But much of life is somewhere in between. And uh, psychologists have thought for many reasons, and psychiatrists, that people with depression tend to fixate on what's negative. The more you think about what's bad, the worse you feel. The worse you feel, the more you know, so it's a negative spiral of attention to things that bring people down. And the way they have approached experimentally is like this. They show two faces. One's, in this case, a neutral expression, which is pretty weird when they're blank looking at you for a while, but it's a neutral expression and a happy expression. And then they disappears, and there's a tiny dot that appears, and you just push a button. You're not deciding if it's left or right. You're just pushing a button as soon as you see the dot. Or they might show you two faces um, like this. Uh, one is a negative expression, one's neutral. And again, a dot will appear in one or the other location, and you push a button. They use the speed with which you respond to decide where you allocated your attention. Did you look at the neutral face or the negative face? Did you look at the neutral face or the positive face? The faster you respond to the location, then we know that's where your attention was glued, where you, put your, where you allocated your attention. And what has been found 
in adults with depression is that they tend to look at the negative face, all right? They're drawn to look at that negative face. That's not true of people with anxiety. It's not true of people who, with, who are the controls with neither anxiety nor depression. So that's a manifestation or a component of, of people with the diagnosis of depression. What about children? In this case, the study from Ian Gottlieb and his colleagues was with girls who are born to mothers with either current or a history of major depression. The girls themselves were not depressed and had not had the diagnosis of depression. But at a, at a group level, they're at a somewhat elevated risk. Do they show this bias to attend to the negative information in their environment? The answer is yes, they do. So they too fixate uh, disproportionately on the negative available information compared to the positive one. In fact, girls who are born uh, to parents without depression go the other direction. They look, they look you know, on the sunny side of the road, right? They, they focus on the positive faces. So we think this is evidence uh, in the mind for a, a fixation to a certain extent on negative information uh, e preceding any incidence of depression. So uh, uh, Jenny Chai and colleagues at MGH and I did a, were involved in a study where we looked at the same kinds of children. So these are children without any uh, history of depression or current depression, and we, they're carefully screened, who are born into families with a parent or two with depression, or pa families without depression. And we asked, what's different in their brains as they view these kinds of emotionally uh, powerful information? So here's the kinds of displays they saw, uh, negative, ex negative expressions or positive ones are in our control conditions. And we're going to ask what happens inside the brains of these individual children uh, in this building downstairs we did the imaging study. Uh, as they view these kinds of pictures, uh, how does their brain respond? And I'm just going to give you a very superficial description, uh, but I, it's the essence of the finding. In the top row, you see how much more children uh, with depression, sorry, decreased response. Uh, how much, how much more powerfully the typically the children born without depression responded to positive faces. Everything you see there in red is a greater response in the children born to families without depression than those with depression. Another way to say it is there's much less of a brain response to positive faces in children at risk for depression. And below that is the exact opposite. When, when a negative face is shown, there's much more activation in the brains of the children born to a family with depression. So prior to the expression of depression, uh, and not all of these children will progress at all. You can already see this different brain focus, responding to the negative or responding to the positive, a vulnerability of a kind. Um, and if we average sort of all the voxels in the brain, just a sort of total vote, you can see on the left there's a much greater response to negative pictures uh, here in the children who are at familial risk for depression, and the much greater response to positive pictures in the children who are born to families without that familial risk. And so we can see this very striking difference in these children and the vulnerability they may have uh, to expressing depression in the years to come. And if we do another kind of measure, and I won't go into detail on this, but I want to tell you one more thing where, where we think this might help us in a practical way. Here we're looking at resting state network differences. And I won't go into the details. They're not doing anything. We're just tracking how different parts of the brain communicate as networks one to the other. There's no task in front of them. And we find many differences between these two groups of children. And one of the differences, I'll just focus on the uh, subgenual anterior cingulate, that's the part of the brain that's been most identified as being very importantly different in people with depression, the target of deep brain stimulation studies and so forth. If we know there's one place in the brain, compare, and, and depression, like everything, is a very diverse, complicated uh, difference, but if there's one place in the brain that's well known to play an important role, it's the anterior, uh, this area. So. Uh, and in fact, if we compare this brain measure to current clinical rating scales, what we find is that the brain measure is more sensitive to identifying these children than current clinical measures. So why is that interesting besides we do brain measures, so we like brain measures? Uh, it's because, you know, maybe this can become a tool to identify people at risk. And if it's better than current clinical interviews, it might be a practical way. Okay. So, um, so that's about depression. So let's talk about uh, income inequality in education and test scores. So uh, as you know, the United States, uh, a very affluent nation, also is one of the world leaders in income inequality. And in fact, in this map, it's key so that the purple areas, the United States, are the sort of baseline area. Everything you see in blue are areas that have less income inequality. Everything you see in red has more income inequality in the United States. So we're a leader in, in, in income inequality. 
And studies in the last few years have shown that uh, although there's been some progress on diminishing the academic achievement gap between white and black Americans, the gap between rich and poor Americans has grown more than ever. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so this is a huge challenge in front of us, and, and these children coming from very vulnerable environments in a huge variety of ways, you know, are not getting the kinds of education. I know gonna, we're going to hear about amazing efforts to fix that. But nationally at the moment, uh, the zip code you're born into is a very powerful predictor of academic achievement. Uh, so in this study in Massachusetts, uh, and we did this in collaboration with a nonprofit um, uh, and, as well as invent, uh, people at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We were able to get from the state the statewide tests of reading and math, the standardized tests for public school students, and brought them into the scanner, 58 eighth graders, 35 from higher income families, 23 from lower income families. I should say that lower income families, although this is changing a little bit, are incredibly underrepresented, underrepresented in the cognitive neuroscience that we know about humans. <laughs> because to get lower income families to come in for brain imaging to an imaging center is a huge process. And I'm really lucky to work with both uh, collaborators both at MIT, incredible graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and research assistants who work phenomenally hard to make families comfortable and pay, pay, you know, pa pave the way for these individuals to come and participate. I'll just say anecdotally to the side, if we do a typical study with children uh, and just put up listservs to parents and stuff, we get, an we get our IQs of the spontaneous research participants in our brain imaging are higher than our ones of MIT students. Why? <laughs> you know, how do we do that? <laughs> Because who sits on a Saturday morning at home and says, wow, there's a brain imaging study at MIT. <laughs> this, would, this would be a phenomenal educational thing for you to do. And the kids go, I was going to watch TV or something. No, no, no. You know, yeah, MIT's near Harvard. There's a lot of good schools over there. We could start now in fifth grade or something. Get you ready here. <laughs> All right. So, so, so I, I just could tell you, if you just spontaneously say, who comes in? You know, historically, it used to be all medical students at imaging centers right now. So, uh, so it, it's, you know, to get children from a diverse background that represents the United States in any sense at all requires a very focused and inspired effort. And we're very lucky. I'm very lucky to work with people who help us do that. So we have these individuals that come from higher and lower income families coming from brain imaging downstairs in this building. We also know how well they're doing uh, academically as you measure, you know, one measure of that is how well they do on tests of reading and math that are statewide measures. And then we measure uh, their structure or anatomy of their brain through magnetic resonance imaging. And so I, I know you know all of this, but not everybody lives uh, in, a, in a neuroscience program here. So uh, there's gray and white matter in the brain. Uh, so the neurons that compute the mind uh, are the stuff of gray matter plus glia. Uh, and the connections between them uh, are axons that communicate from one neuron to another. Those are myelinated, so the message moves quickly and accurately to its distant target to create orchestrated networks of the brain that do almost everything interesting that we care about. Um, and then we can measure the, the, the quantity and quality of the white and gray matter. So the next slide shows you just a standard MRI scan that measures brain structure moving from one ear to the other. And then Allison Mackey in our lab and others who work with her uh, take these brain images and quantify, in this case, the thickness of the neocortex. How thick, as far as we can measure by MRI, how thick is that neocortex? Uh, and then we compare, we relate it to test scores and we relate it to, uh, to socioeconomic status or family income. So let me show you the first outcome of this. The first outcome is that, uh, so let me tell you what this picture is because it's not the usual picture. And so let me tell you what this is. So everything you see the left and right hemispheres, everything that you see in red and yellow has the following property. It meets the statistical threshold. It's a, you know, it's a science result, if you want to call it that. The thicker the cortex in that part of the brain, the better the child did on the statewide tests. So this is a link between academic achievement as measured by statewide tests of reading and math and the thickness in that part of the cortex. Uh, so thicker is better for this score. I have to tell you, that thicker is not always better. The predominant thing that happens, uh, actually, from about middle childhood, about you know, or through a, uh, through adulthood, is a thinning of the neocortex from about age five or six until you're about twenty. Thinning, thinning, thinning. Right. So it's a much more complicated story than simply uh, thinner or thicker. But at this age, in eighth grade, 
a thicker cortex, the thicker cortex a student has on average, the better they do on tests of reading and math. Knowing this, then here comes the next analysis of the same children, but instead of looking at the relationship to test scores, what I'm gonna show you is the difference between children who come from more or less affluent families. And the way we divided that is a very coarse way, but whether they qualified for free or reduced lunch or not. We have other information and it aligns with that. So here's the difference between eighth graders in, in, in public schools in Boston across the river who uh, came from relative affluence or relative poverty. It's big. Uh, and uh, it's thicker too. The thicker cortex goes with coming from a family that's more affluent. To a first approximation, our findings are very similar to larger samples reported in the last year from Kim Noble uh, and Seth Pollack. And, so, and it, it, it's, it's always kind of in this direction. So, and those were, so we were, we're, although there's details that are different, you know, ours are one age, they covered many different ages. And so, but anyways, here's a huge consequence in the brain. So let me say two things about this at least. So sometimes people think, oh, it's biological, it must be genetic. I, you know, I don't know where that comes from, but I have to, it's an intuition that people have. Uh, and the brain represents all of genetics, but it represents all of experience, right? Everything one learns, everything one experiences, right? All the environmental influences that we care about and want to have a happy home, a good school, all of those shape the brain. To learn something is to change the brain, right? <laughs> to feel something is to change the brain. So uh, when we see this, what we see writ upon the brain is the consequence we think of something related to socioeconomic status, but it uh, doesn't mean that it's genetic, and it doesn't mean that it's fixed, all right? Sometimes people will think, well, if it's anatomical, it's fixed. But it's no more fixed than a child size it grows and changes with experience, all right? So you know, a child is not fixed at this height, they're gonna go to that height, okay? So, uh, uh, so you know, we have lots of room to make fantastic differences. In a way, if we didn't see this brain difference, we know that our brain measures would be bad, right? Because we know overwhelmingly there's behavioral evidence that of course the quality of home life, the quality of schools that you, you have makes a tremendous difference in the lives of children. And one way it makes that is how it molds and sculpts the brain. And so we're just able to measure that, that now in a way that we hadn't before, partly by some advances in imaging and partly by a determination to include the wide scope of society. And you know, a huge weakness in this line of research, of course, is that there's so many elements, we heard about it this morning, of socioeconomic status, and we have very little sense of which piece is contributing to the story. Is it uh, the stress we heard about, reduced language stimulation at home? Is it fewer opportunities for cognitive enrichment, both in school and out of school? Healthcare, we heard about that this morning. Greater exposure for environmental toxins. I mean, all these things are all bundled together at the moment, and they're not easy to separate. I mean, and that's why animal work will always be really important because there's some separation that occur there. Humans lead complicated lives, and they tend, these things tend to bundle. Um, so I've shown you these correlates of the risk for depression and the consequence of being born to poverty as opposed to affluence in the brain that we can measure directly now. Um, and you know, it's like the weather. I've shown you correlates. We don't want to just know the, and predict the weather. We want to do something about it. I mean, all day long, I believe, is a call to action in various ways, and people pursuing all the different range of things from basic science to changing school systems that must occur if we're going to make big changes. Um, and at the one hand, you know, I think every speaker probably is full of tremendous optimism. I mean, we wouldn't be here today if we didn't think we could do something that makes a difference, right? Uh, at the same time, it's pretty stark in many ways. So let me show you one, two examples, just the reality of where we were and why the challenge is so urgent and important and we feel all that, I think. One of them is uh, suicide rates, an ultimate expression of, of a mental health uh, you know, difficulty. Up 30 year high, despite all the efforts to do this. And you know, one of many statistics, three a three fold increase in girls 10 to 14 uh, over the last 30 years. I mean, so we have a huge challenge in front of us you know, to not, to make it, have it to get to a 30 year low as we go forward. The other one is despite incredibly interesting efforts that may make, you know, will make uh, such a difference in the lives of children, the socioeconomic gap in regards to academic achievement is startlingly uh, powerful to this moment. As, this is a recent uh, paper that came out in the New York Times. 
And just to give you the statistics again, sixth graders in the richest school districts are four grade levels ahead of children in the poorest districts. This is a very compelling analysis where they took nearby areas in different, uh, across quite a number of states, and they compared, if you go to a, you know, from a wealthy community, sort of intermediate community, middle class community, and poor one, I mean, that many years of difference by that age and educational status and attainment, right? You know, it's not something, you know, I don't know, it makes us mad, doesn't it? I mean, you know, optimistically we're going to do it, but, you know, it's a, it, we just need, you know, something that's just not the right thing. We know that. So besides lamenting this, you know, and you're here, you know, there's lots of calls for action. Let me tell you a couple of directions we're thinking about going. So in terms of mental health, um, if we track children who are at familial risk, the majority of them will not develop depression and anxiety. So we think tracking longitudinally these sort of children, the ones who don't develop have something really important to tell us, which is what are the sources of resilience in the environment, in their genetics, in their brains that let them pass through this risk without severe consequence. So that's one thing, to learn from the resilient, uh, what are the other factors that make a difference and prevent a child from expressing depression or anxiety. The second one is, you know, uh, you know we're very excited about the idea of early preventive intervention. Why not take children who are at high risk uh, and give them something like family-based cognitive behavioral therapy? I think we'd be low, I think we'd be worried about giving medications to a child who does not have a medical problem. Uh, but something like behavioral support, uh, there's a tremendous literature that CBT is very powerful and effective for people with depression or anxiety, not for everybody, but for many. Uh, why not offer that to families where a child is shown to be at biological or psychological risk? and see if you can, uh, by this kind of preventive or early intervention, have the child never express depression or anxiety in his or her lifetime. I mean, that's a, I think that's a you know, doable goal. And where the brain measure might come in to be useful, the, the outcome, the thing that matters is not the brain measure, right? The thing that matters is that the child is happy and thriving. Uh, but where the brain measure is kind of interesting is it takes a number of years to see how a child did. Did your intervention work, right? You can't wait one month, one year, because it could be a couple of years later. So if the brain measures turn out to be as sensitive as we hope they might be, they might give us an early marker instantly of whether a therapy is changing brain function and structure in a way that we think is conducive to good mental health. And so although we have to do the longitudinal studies, maybe we can get a marker that's almost instantaneous of whether the early preventive intervention is working or not. And if it's not working, something else needs to be done. If it did work, great. So we're hoping brain measures might be part of the arsenal by which we develop uh, uh, preventive or very early interventions. As you know, in, in lots of areas, we sort of wait for crisis or catastrophe. We wait for somebody to be in such a miserable state, so far behind. Uh, and then, you know, we, we, that's the call to action. And, you know, look, 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 I think there's a goal to not do that. Socioeconomic status. Um, so again, I want to remind you that although I showed you these brain things, we know there's unbelievable evidence. The animal work is spectacular. I'm sitting in front of neuroscientists who've, who've shown the seminal plasticity of the brain for the entire field and world. Uh, but we also know now from neuroimaging, which is a very modest measure of brain structure and function compared to animal work, that the brain is phenomenally plastic. So uh, nothing that I've shown you today makes us any less uh, hopeful. But we would like to know what educational or public health policies do have a positive influence on the brain, which will be the identical ones that have it on the mind, right? The mind is what the brain does. So the two things will travel in parallel. And um, I can tell you about two studies just for a minute. I'll tell you that we're trying now. So these are randomized controlled trials in Boston public schools. Sixth graders are getting a mindfulness intervention. The, Bruce talked about mindfulness. Uh, we're right now evaluating whether the mindfulness intervention worked. I have to tell you, our control condition and as I say, I feel bad about saying this at MIT, was a programming course for the other children randomly assigned, right? So sitting, ar sitting around the table, sitting around the table, uh, for those people who are parents, half of them said, if it were my kid, I, want, I hope he or she gets assigned to the programming course, because that's, you know, that's, that's the way they're going to make their future. And the other half of the parents who are researchers around the table said, no, no, I want the mindfulness, because it has good effects on cognition, but also mental health, anxiety, confidence. You know, we'll do the science. And our, our, our fingers are crossed that it worked. Um, we also had a number of those children come over here for brain imaging before and after. Uh, so we're going to find, we'll know in a kind of month whether that worked. I think 
Many attempts will not work, or they'll work for a subset of children. We're hoping that knowing something about their brains will help us understand for which children these things work or don't work, as you heard about earlier this morning. So that's a mindfulness. The other thing is an amazing uh, program developed by Phil Fisher and then again by Helen Neville at Oregon, where they bring in parents from lower income families, Head Start families in Oregon, and they give them uh, eight sessions uh, where they get very uh, precise family coaching with the parents about things to do that are of practical help to parents at home, all inspired by science but not communicated as science. And in the other room, in their study, they were, they were Head Start nursery school children or preschool children. So they were doing games that were meant to enhance their executive functions and focus of attention. And in this random assignment study, not only did they show benefits of executive function in the children, which are very hard to achieve, also parents were happier. Uh, and uh, they showed, measuring EEG, they showed a brain difference, which to my knowledge is the only random controlled trial showing a brain benefit for children from lower income families from an intervention. Again, the important benefit is not the brain thing. It's, it's gotta be always happening. It's the mental thing. It's the child is happier, did it better at school, that kinds of stuff. We know that's the important outcome. But it's kind of you know, nice to see the brain thing going with that. And so, uh, so we don't, and the other thing that I'll say is uh, I, I did not attend the sessions with the families. We're just finishing up across the river with kindergarten students and their families participating in, either the, in, in, in these groups. The other thing I heard, which was very touching, and sh I should have thought of that, but as a scientist, sometimes I'm, I'm more about numbers than people, but I should have thought of that, was apparently this, the, there's just small groups together with a trained facilitator of about six mothers or fathers. Apparently the relations among the mothers or fathers as they come in week after week is compellingly powerful as they share the wishes for their children and how to do better at home. So I focused on get, helping getting the people trained who did it, you know, who are phenomenal, uh, but the human interaction was just so powerful amongst these parents. And so we're, this is the last week they're in the program, uh, and then we're gonna compare how those children and parents are doing compared to our control group, um, and you know, we'll know that very shortly. So, um, and the other thing that I think that's really interesting is, uh, uh, <coughs> We know that although on average, on average, uh, children from uh, lower socioeconomic status environments score less well than children from higher ones in terms of academic achievement and attainment, there are many individuals from lower SES environments that do really well, okay, many. So, uh, so we're just starting a study where we were gonna go find these individuals uh, and ask what their brains look like and what their minds look like. How do children succeed who do succeed? And we're totally, you know, we've, there's two possibilities. One is, will their brains and minds, as we measure them in different ways, will they look like high SES children? That's one possibility. The other possibility is that they'll find an adaptive way to succeed in the world that will be quite different. And that's just as good, right? But then we have a different model because we, our model doesn't always have to be, you know, that everybody has to end up like a child's mind and brain from a high SES environment. Um, effective schooling and support and whatever makes a child do well in a low SES environment, that could work differently in the mind and brain. But then we need to know that. We need to know is there, is there socioeconomic diversity in paths to real success? And so we wanna know that because otherwise we'll just spend all our lives saying, oh, these brains are really different and it looks disadvantageous, but maybe there's patterns in there that are phenomenally advantageous, but we don't know how to find them, right? So instead of doing the average, look at the children who are succeeding and ask what is the secret in their brain that let them succeed and how can we promote that for all children. Uh, so that we have diverse developmental pathways for flourishing amongst children. There's many ways perhaps to succeed and we need to know what those ways are. So I've showed you, you know, some evidence in the brains of uh, children uh, at risk in, in different ways uh, from environments that we consider to be stressful in some ways. But I, I think there's a lot of ways uh, that, and we've heard about it in terrific different ways this morning and, and this afternoon again, you know, that we can really possibly do something that makes a difference. And, you know, you could be daunted or you could be inspired. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think from the speakers I heard this morning and I know the, the, about the, the speakers this afternoon, I think we're all going to be inspired to, you know, contribute in the way that each of us can to make this huge difference in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.